Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, for this uh, uh, lecture this evening from Duncan Green. Uh, my name is Hugh Cole. I am a uh, visiting fellow of practice here at the Blavatnik School. Uh, I'm also the director of country programs for something called the International Growth Center, which is a partnership between the London School of Economics and uh, University of Oxford. And we work, uh, we aim to provide uh, demand-led policy advice on economic growth questions to developing country governments based on the latest frontier research. Um, we've done, what Duncan will be talking to us uh, about tonight is the contents of a book that he's written uh, on how change ha entitled How Change Happens. And it uh, is an amalgamation of a lot of the lessons that he's learned uh, working with uh, particularly activists, but a broad range of people seeking change all over the world over many years. And I think that uh, it's, it's an important topic for a school like the Blavatnik School, which its mission is to, be, to see a world better led, a world better served, and a world better governed. Because it's all very well knowing what you want to see change in the world. It's a very different question about how to achieve that change. And that is a lot of what Duncan is going to talk to us about tonight. So the format uh, for this yeah, the, for the session is that Duncan will speak to us for 30 to 40 minutes, um, and then we'll have a Q&A. Uh, we'll, um, we'll sit down, and, and I'll ask uh, Duncan a question to get kicked off, and then we'll open the floor for questions from all of you. Uh, and we'll aim to be wrapped up in an hour, maybe a little bit more. So that's the format for tonight. Thank you all very much for joining us. And if you'd like to join me in welcoming Duncan. Thanks, Hugh. Um, so I've got two hats, like Hugh does. Um, most of the time I work for Oxfam as a strategic advisor, which is an entirely meaningless job title. Um, I'm not very strategic and no one takes my advice, but we had to call it something. Um, and then a day a week, I, uh, I'm a professor in practice, which is also a misnomer, uh, at the London School of Economics, uh, where Hugh is as well. Um, okay, so I've got half an hour to explain the topic of the book. Um, oh, damn. Uh, I'm going to try and sell you the book at the end. Um, I forgot that the free PDF is up here as well. This was um, from a, uh, never mind, I should have deleted it. Never mind. So if you want the book for free, you can get it off, uh, you can download it, or you can buy a copy outside at the end. Whoops, moving swiftly on before you can write that down. Um, so <laughs> the book summarizes. Um, a move in my thinking where I started to think of change as a thing in itself rather than just attached to a bunch of particular stories. And I had to try and work out when that process uh, happened. And I've, I lighted on a, a trip to India in 2006, which is one of those fantastic field trips which are like a sort of rolling seminar, um, light bulbs going off in your head, fantastic conversations, and you come back different. Um, and this was a trip to Madhya Pradesh, um, overnight train ride from Delhi. And it was a trip to visit some fishing communities. And these fishing communities had a really interesting story. So I'm going to start here. And the, 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 their story kind of sums up a lot of the lessons which I then unpacked uh, in the book uh, over the next few years. So they're lower caste. They're at the bottom of the heap. Um, they've been fishing these artificial ponds for centuries. Um, a couple of decades ago, someone realized that you could massively increase the productivity of these ponds by putting in baby fish or fish eggs. Suddenly, the yields went up, and that was a disaster for these communities because upper caste people smelt the money, came in, drove them off. So first, interesting, ooh, look how quickly a technological shift turns into political and social disruption. When they were driven off, most of them accepted their fate. These are lower caste uh, uh, communities, and in India, being lower caste is a life-defining state. They expected to be treated badly, but 12 of them actually resisted and protested and got beaten up. They were beaten up by thugs hired by the upper caste uh, people who were taking the ponds. And at that point, the communities said, you can't treat our boys like that, got up and started a much bigger process of social mobilization. So lesson there, interesting that a moment of conflict and violence triggers social change. Very difficult if you work for Oxfam, set up by Quakers, deeply pacifist, doesn't want to think that violence could be part of a change process, but it is. Um, if they had just protested, they probably wouldn't have got very far, but they found an ally. 
in the form of a Brahmin, upper caste, former civil servant who had retired from the Indian civil service and set up an NGI, a non-governmental individual. Okay. You've probably come across these people. They kind of, you know, they, they have little briefcases, and in their briefcases is invariably a project, right, which they're going to try and sell to you. So the NGI adopted these guys, um, and because he was Brahmin, he could open doors. So he got them in to talk to the police chief. He got them to talk to the uh, state fishing minister, and a process began. Um, the police chief took a case. The uh, fishing minister actually ended up passing a cooperative law saying if you formed a co-op, you had the right to reclaim the ponds. So I went there in 2006. By that time, it was a really inspiring story. They had 150 ponds back under community control. I you know, gathered the stories, scuttled back to the UK, and then did what any sensible um, development person does, which is not go back. Okay? Because if you go back to one of these nice, iconic stories which you tell everyone about, usually something's gone horribly wrong. Normally, someone's run away with the money or it turns out it was never that good a story in the first place, you just didn't understand it. So I kept it in a nice little you know, case, but then this year I had to go back, uh, well last year actually in April, I had to go back because it was so kind of crucial to my thinking. Went back there with the Brahmin, found the same Brahmin, went back to the communities, and it was really interesting what had changed in the last 10 years. No one had run away with the money. The number of ponds had shifted to 250 from 150. Um, there were demonstrations with quarter of a million people. You know, this is a big social movement in that part of India. Um, the, they no longer needed the Brahmin. That was really interesting. They said, you know, we now deal directly with decision makers, politicians. We don't need that, in, that intermediary anymore. Um, the gender shift has been really interesting. So 10 years ago, there were some signs of kind of quite assertive women organization, women's organization, sort of some women-only co-ops. This time was extraordinary. In 10 years, a big shift had, took place, had taken place. And for the first time and only time in my sort of career, my time in development, I actually heard myself saying in the middle of a meeting, excuse me, could the women shut up? I want to hear what the men think which has never happened to me ever you know, before. But it was just an extraordinary shift. But in spite of that shift, while I was there with the Brahmin, people were scuttling up, sort of crouched, and touching his toes out of respect. So a really interesting sort of combination. Some norms had massively changed, some hadn't changed. So it's just a sort of partial shift, but a really big transformation. So I was you know, really fascinating. That's what makes Oxfam you know, such a good place to work for when you get these stories. You spend a lot of time in meetings and talk, you know, flip charts and all the rest of the nonsense in order to occasionally have experiences like this. I'm now going to systematize that into a really boring presentation, but that was the kind of thing on which all this is based. A little bit about the book. So the book starts in a slightly unusual place in that I became in increasingly interested in systems thinking. When I started the book, I used to hear people say in meetings, well, this is a systems issue. I never knew what they meant, right? And I thought that's probably just, they're probably just trying to, you know, impress. Um, I am now one of those people who goes, this is a systems issue, which obviously I'm very happy about. Um, but I started, I think actually there's enough substance in the systems question, I'll talk about that in a minute, that it really does change the way I think about development and the way I think other people should think about development. Then the book goes through the kind of institutions um, uh, which are involved in change processes, the state, um, rule of law, but the international system as well. It's aimed at change actors, activists, um, but the definition of activist is very broad. It's not just people out protesting on the street, although probably we should be right now. Um, it's about people who are trying to bring about change within institutions, people we would call reformers, people who are just active, dynamic in pursuing change processes within any given system. Um, and then the so what's, which is the weakest part of these kind of general books on development, is usually the last bit. Usually you get a great diagnosis, this is what's wrong with the world, um, and then very little about what people should do differently. So I spent a lot of time dragging advice from people, lessons, what do you do differently. I'm going to talk about the first bit and the last bit, and you'll just have to take on trust uh, the bit in the middle. Uh, I hope that's okay. So systems and power. The cake. To make a cake, you need ingredients, you need a recipe, you need an oven. And if you follow the ingredients, uh, follow the recipe and the ingredients are okay and the oven works, you'll be able to make a cake. You can predict that the, the result of your activity will be a cake. If you get a cake at the end, you know it's because you followed the recipe. 
It's a linear process and a predictable process. Welcome to the project. The plan that underlies activism, aid, um, and a lot of activity is extraordinarily dominated by this artifact called the project. And the project, for all the sort of variations and bells and whistles, the project is essentially a linear process by which you say, here's my plan, I'm going to do this in order to achieve this. And if I achieve this, which I will find out by monitoring and evaluating results, I will be able to attribute that change to my activities. And then I will go back to the funder or whoever's authorized this and get agreement to do some more. And that's the kind of the, the bread and butter of activism and of aid. And we apply it in situations like this. This is a famous US military PowerPoint from Afghanistan. Um, and it's, a, a, it's an attempt to work out who influences who in Afghanistan, right? Uh, the, the, the consultants who drew it up um, was immediately sacked when he showed it to General Petraeus in Afghanistan. Uh, it was leaked, uh, John Stewart took the mickey out of it, various people laughed at it. I looked at it and I thought, wow, that's really good. I wish our Afghan team were doing stakeholder mapping of that quality. It's a really genuine effort to, find, to understand a complex system. Now, a complex system has particular qualities. There are so many feedbacks and, and, and network effects that if you poke that system with a lot of money or a lot of soldiers, effects will ripple through and you cannot predict what will happen next. It's not that you're not smart enough, you cannot know however many computers, however many PhDs, you cannot predict what will happen next. And if something changes, and these systems change all the time, you cannot attribute that change with certainty to any particular cause. Now this is obvious, this is, why, this is life, okay? This is, you don't know what your life is gonna be when you're 15 or 20 or 25. Um, you don't, when you're raising a child, you don't say, right, I'm gonna design a log frame for that child for the next 18 years, which will set out every you know, activity and, and, and in advance, because those things, that's not how things work. We work by learning, changing, fast feedback, response. But in the world of activism and aid, we have the cake, we have the project. And we really struggle to find projectable bits that work. And a lot of the sort of underlying reason why a lot of projects fail is because they're not suited to this kind of complex system. The way change happens in complex systems is different from linear systems. Linear systems tend to change quite smoothly. Um, you, know, you can do this in year one, this in year two, this in year three. Complex systems are characterized by spikes, sudden discontinuities, sudden, sudden moments when everything is thrown up in the air. I think we're living through a very big one at the moment with Brexit, election of Trump, possibly right-wing uh, populist victories in France, Netherlands, Philippines. There's a lot of stuff going on at the moment. When you stand back and look at those moments later, what you see is that all the social assumptions, the political assumptions, the status quo was thrown up in the air, new possibilities emerge. So if you're interested in bringing about change, you should be thinking about those critical junctures. When, what, which ones can you predict? And the unpredictable ones, how fast can you detect, think about, and respond to them? What you shouldn't do is say, something's happening, but I've got my plan to implement, I've got my campaign, I've got my project. And that happens far too often for, for my liking. The other thing about those complex systems is that everywhere is different. Everywhere is a product of its own history. Again, it's a platitude, it's obvious. But then what is the value of all those best practice guidelines, frameworks, toolkits, which the aid and development sort of set love and produce in vast numbers? Do we just throw those away and approach each, each context, each situation with a blank sheet of paper? Probably not. But what we do need to do is to adapt what we think of as good practice, not best, but good practice, far more to the local context. So the book argues that this is a big problem for the traditional approach to, to, to uh, aid and, and, and activism and that we need a new approach. Um, part of that approach is understanding power. Now, two of my key guinea pigs when I was writing the book were my sons. And um, that's led to a certain strange quality about the book in that all the cultural references are to the point when my two sons were talking to me. Um, so they're all about sort of early 2000s, or, or, um, um, so we have The Matrix, The Wire, Harry Potter, and then it just stops, okay? So there's a kind of period piece quality to it already, even though it's only been published, just been published. This is The Matrix, 
uh, the first film. Who's seen The Matrix? Let me see. Okay. Good. I can make this connection. If you've seen The Matrix 2 and 3, I'm very sorry. You know, um, we all make mistakes. Um, the first Matrix film is a great study in adolescent angst. Um, and the, there's a moment when the thinly disguised Messiah figure, Neo, um, sees the Matrix behind reality, the ones and zeros that actually constitute the, the sort of the, the, the underlying field of reality, and he becomes invincible. When you read and think about power, at least in my case, there were moments when I started to have neo-like delusions, that power is in some sense the matrix. If you tra start trying to make power visible and understand how power is distributed in different situations and how it's being renegotiated and redistributed, that starts to feel something like an underlying force field of development. Um, that's very general. Uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the different ways that different uh, 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 people have, have explained power and come up with frameworks to make the power, to make the matrix visible. This is Guatemalan indigenous activist channeling Foucault. Okay? So, um, why do we not speak? We had internalized repression. Okay? They gave us words for ourselves stupid, you can't, you don't know, poor thing. And from that process of internal repression, an internal sort of subordination, they've actually emerged to actually do something extremely scary, which is stand up to the Guatemalan security forces with their daughters. Now, how that process from going to, from internalized subordination to doing something as brave as this takes place is fascinating. Um, there are different ways of thinking about it, but the key for me is, is power within. It's a, it's a concept which um, uh, a colleague at Oxfam, Joe Rowlands, has written about a lot, and she says, it's often a light bulb moment. It can be a moment, it can be a process. People get a sudden sense of anger, of I'm not gonna accept this anymore, I have rights, I am a person, and I have dignity, and I should, I'm gonna say stop doing that and do this instead. What brings that about can be anything. It can be a role model, a faith, you know, a pastor or a, an imam. It could be a member of the family. Um, it can be very weird stuff as well. So two, two examples of the weirder fringes of these light bulb moments. I was uh, in a bar with an indigenous activist in Bolivia who looked at me and said, you know, the thing that changed my life was ILO Convention 169. Okay, it's not a normal conversation. Um, so he'd read this rather long, turgid, you know, uh, ILO uh, doc, uh, convention on indigenous rights, and he said, "When I read that, the indigenous, indigenous part of me woke up." I was in another. I don't spend a lot of time in bars, but I, I was in another bar with um, somebody who's uh, actually quite an influential thinker at UN levels, and I said. What was your moment of conversion? It's always a really good conversation to have with people. What was your moment of conversion? He said, well, you know, I was at university. I was in a club. I was off my face on E. And I looked across at everybody dancing, and I just felt this enormous sense of love for humanity. And I decided to devote myself to development and the environment. Okay? There are many ways that people get these light bulb moments. I'm, sadly, neither of those apply to me in particular. But um, when they've achieved these moments, they look around and they see people in similar situations and they start to organize it. It just happens spontaneously. Um, and you get a sense of power with. So from power within, you get to power with. Uh, and, and then things kick off. And, and one of the nice things about Oxfam is how quickly they spiral out of control. In Nepal, we had this very nice project Women's discussion classes, what could be safer than that? The idea was that women were quite secluded in their homes, so they were coming together in women only groups choosing topics for discussion, inviting speakers. We had a local NGO arranging the, the, the event. Um, and uh, then they would just have discussions and sort of you know, uh, raise their awareness. Within a couple of months, the discussions had turned to, are we going to burn down the local alcohol stalls because they're selling liquor to our men and our men are beating us up? All right? At which point our partners went, oh, this wasn't in the plan, um, and we went into damage limitation, we involved the police. Apparently, it was, I'm in a conversation about, did they actually burn things down at the moment with some people in Nepal? They smashed some things up, but I don't think they actually went the full arson. Okay? Um, but it became an interesting issue of power with suddenly spiraling out of control and people actually taking charge. When you have that power with, then you start to have power to influence, power over 
the mechanisms of, 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 of resource allocation and political decision making. And these are the sort of, they're not, it's not a sequence, they, but it's a nice way to disaggregate power. There are many other ways to make power visible. There's the power cube, from which has been developed by uh, the Institute of Development Studies, other ways. They all are helpful in terms of asking where the power is in the room. The final one I use a lot, and it's really the crudest and simplest of the lot, is from Robert Chambers uh, uh, at IDS, who says, in any interaction, just ask yourself who is the upper and who is the lower, because that will affect what is said and what is unsaid, what is done and what is not done. So just, just be aware of the power in the room. There was a, another thing I'm trying to track down at the moment, um, a piece of research in West Africa where they did some... Uh, some black researchers were doing survey questions to local members of the community, and then in a randomized you know, sample of them, they put a white researcher in the back of the room, silent, didn't say anything. They got substantially different responses to the, to, to the survey questions. Just the sense of power emanating from that white person in the back of the room was enough to distort the findings. So being aware of, uh, uh, of power in those upper-lower relationships is really important. That's all quite abstract. We use it in very practical ways. So Oxfam um, is, uses power analysis a lot. Uh, and, and this is one example from Tajikistan. Um, we'd spent a couple of days down looking at water and sanitation in Tajikistan, uh, a fairly dismal kind of post-Soviet grim malaise. Is anybody here from Tajikistan? OK, I'm going to be very careful about what I say there. Um, <laughs> Good, I should have checked that first. Um, a lovely country, <laughs> but a few problems left over from the Soviet period. I think it's fair to say, right? Um, so we were down in, uh, in the villages investigating this, then we came back to the headquarters with our Tajik staff and partners, and we sat down with them and said, okay, so who are the, who are the who's involved in the decisions on water and sanitation? And they did what activists always do. They said, there's the state and there's the people and the people should make demands on the state. And we said, okay, that's a start. Um, what else? And then they started to talk. And they said, well, you know, the truck driver is important because he brings all the news from local villages, and so people go to him as a kind of nodal individual. And the, the, the teacher's really respected, and people go and ask for help with filling in forms or dealing with bureaucracy. Obviously, the mayor's really important as a decision maker, but if the mayor's not listening, the mayor's lover is a really good contact because the mayor's lover has huge influence over the mayor and suddenly a, an ecosystem started to emerge a much more realistic sort of ecosystem of stakeholders a bit more like the Afghan map and then we said okay let's let's put them on this two by two on one axis you have um, I, can't, no, I don't know which is which so I'm really worried about what you're going to say but I think on this axis it's how influential are people and on this one how much do they want to do something about water and sanitation if they want to do something about water and sanitation, but they don't have much influence, then the job of a, an external, like an NGO or an Oxfam partner, would be to try and help them get more influential. So maybe introduce them to the equivalent of the Brahmin, maybe help them to organize, maybe help, help them with money, whatever's required to get them up there. If they're influential, but they don't actually care much about water and sanitation, you have a range of options. If you're a Blavatnik, you probably think research. Okay? Just one more paper should be enough, um, preferably written by me. Yeah? Uh, that does work occasionally. There are many other ways to influence uh, people who are influential. Um, taking them to see something, really important. If, they think, you know, if they're just not aware of the problem, show them it, take them there. The messenger rather than the message. Who are they either impressed by or, or scared of? Get them to talk to them rather than... Yeah, the NGO or the, the, the activist. Um, particular moments when people are looking for answers, often around crisis, is when you can actually get to these people and say, this is a problem. So there's a sort of the dynamics. And basically, you're just trying to get people up to the top right-hand side, and then you start to get action. We've used this very similar technique working on global campaigns on climate change all the way down to a village in Tajikistan. And it's kind of useful. You're about to tell me how many minutes? OK. Sorry? OK. So I showed the draft to my guinea pigs, my sons, and, and the one who's uh, the activist said, this is great. Yeah, he's a very nice son. Um, but unless you boil it down into two slides, it will be of no use because I'll never remember it when I'm in a meeting or a, a, yeah, a negotiation or whatever. And I said, but the whole point of the book is I'm against blueprints and toolkits and every situation is different. He said, well, fine. 
But unless you do that, you know, it'll be a waste of time. So I took a deep breath and thought, how far can I go? Because I don't want to produce another toolkit, but I think there is something you can boil down. So I came up with this thing I call the power and systems approach. Um, and it talks about the kinds of mentality you need to work in these complex systems and the kind of questions to ask. But it doesn't say what the answers should be because those are going to be different in each context and at each time. So it's about as far as I can go towards the two slide issue. So if you're in that Afghan situation, you have to have a kind of deep curiosity. You have to be really interested in how it's changing without you. What's going on in the system? There's a woman called Danella Meadows who wrote a wonderful book called Thinking in Systems who says we have to learn to dance with the system. Um, I was in Myanmar in September and we were having a typical NGO conversation about the state, the military, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's party and civil society and the media. And it was kind of, you know, talk about the relation between those players is quite interesting. And then someone sort of just mentioned funerals on the margins of the conversation. And we had an academic with us who, an academic's incentive systems are more to find out new stuff. So she said, well, what's that about, the funerals? And we found out there was this massive social movement going on in Myanmar about the cost of funerals, demanding free funerals. And actually, you know, over the centuries, burial and free burial has been a big motivator of, um, uh, of social movements. So now she's writing a paper about it, so she's happy. And we know uh, and we now have, have seen a new element in the system, which we wouldn't have spotted if it wasn't for her. So we don't have that curiosity which she had. Humility. Now, this is an overused word, okay? But I don't mean that kind of false humility, which is very common, you know, humbled by my third Oscar, that sort of humility. I mean, evidence-based humility. If you're in that Afghan situation, you really don't know what's going to happen. You can't predict. Now, that's really difficult for, for activists, broadly defined, because... One of the things you need to be and do as an activist is to be very confident, very assertive. Often you're talking to people who are more powerful than you, so you have to be very you know, forceful and sort of speak truth to power, stick it to the man. How do you do that at the same time as thinking in the back of your head, this may all be wrong, I'm going to have to rev revisit this, I need to allow for ambiguity, doubt, and changing my mind about things. And I think it's one of those really difficult balances. But the op what's the alternative? The either, either you become totally certain whatever the evidence, we see plenty of that going on around the world at the moment, or you become so racked by ambiguity and doubt that you never do anything, which roughly describes me. Okay? You want to be somewhere in the middle if you're going to actually bring change uh, about. Reflexivity. So conscious of your own role, conscious of your own power, not thinking you are... Uh, invisible in a, in a particular power field, realizing what you're, what you're in, uh, how you're disrupting the system. And then the final one is systems are richer and more resilient and stronger and more innovative, more sort of evolutionary if they are diverse. But activists and the aid business actively seek and cul cultivate monocultures. We like people who are like us. We like people who talk our weird language and, and share our fairly obscure assumptions about the way the world is. Um, one example, I think NGOs find it incredibly hard to work with faith communities because faith communities do not do evidence-based policy. They do faith-based policy. That's like what they do. Um, and yet those faith organizations are the ones that are most trusted by poor people around the world. All the research is really pretty solid on this. So how do we work with them? Well, basically, we're not very well. We're much happier working with civil society organizations who can fill in our forms, have all the, the right you know, processes in place, and that's a massively reduced set of potential players in the system. I think we have to get out of that and have to think much more widely about how you put together diverse coalitions around different change processes. The questions we ask, what kind of change? We spend a lot of time on policies, practices, spending decisions. But if you stand back, I think social norms, that idea of what is natural and normal and desirable in the behaviors of human beings is one of the things that's changed incredibly fast. It's provoking backlashes on issues like sexuality and migration, but it's also um, front lashes as well. So good progress. Um, we've done very little thinking about how norms shift on how to get better at shifting norms. Um, and I think it's a really big missing piece in, in, in our understanding of how change happens. Precedence, two kinds of precedent. One is history, 
Um, I was lobbying somebody from Bravatnik on the way in. Um, Oxfam works on inequality. Right? Um, we think income redistribution is necessary in many countries where inequality is extremely uh, strong. No one has noticed that there are 23 countries who've actually redistributed in the last 50 years. Um, uh, uh, that they've done so significantly over a period of eight years or more. We're trying to find someone, an academic partner, to do uh, a comparative analysis of why did those 23 countries do it? What were the politics? What did they do? What were the policies? And then what were the politics that led to the end of these redistributive episodes? People aren't interested in history in, that, in terms of finding useful lessons. Um, and the, the other precedent is around us. So there's a fantastic uh, book uh, called The Power of Positive Deviance, which says on any issue, it's, there's never a spike. There's always a distribution if you're looking at child malnutrition, if you're looking at disease, if you're looking at um, you know, any issue, there will be some positive outliers. So the positive deviance approach says, well, let's just start by identifying the positive outliers and seeing why they're there. What is it about these kids in the Vietnamese village that mean they're less malnourished than everybody else? Extraordinarily obvious. The system throws up partial total solutions of its own accord because things are constantly changing. Very hard to turn into a project, which I think is probably why it's so rarely used. So I think there's some really interesting things on precedence that we need to get better at. The power I've talked about too much already. And then how will we know if change is happening? So imagine that I had come to Blavatnik from Oxfam's um, office up in uh, Cowley based on a log frame, based on a plan. Okay, so in, before I leave on my bicycle, I decide in advance the speed and direction of travel at each moment over the 30 minutes to get to Blavatnik. Clearly, I mean, Cowley Road is a scary place anyway on a bicycle, and I would die, okay? Because the only way you can get anywhere on a bicycle is by fast feedback and course correction. And that's actually what activism has to be like as well. It's got to notice and adjust, not all the time, but you need regular timeouts to assess when you need to change the way you're, you're, you're working. And there's not enough of that in the book saying we need to do a lot more than that. I'm going to skip through these things, which are a bit nerdy, and end up with... There's a really good book, a really good two-thirds of a book by Angus Deaton called The Great Escape. Okay? The first two-thirds, fantastic. It's on inequality. It's on how everything's getting better. And then the third is this weird bitch about aid, which I don't agree with, but um, we'll let that pass. The point Angus is making is that if you stand back and f uh, for a moment, the world looks very different from the way it looks in the headlines, even now. So, you know, the headlines we're seeing now are pretty grim, Syria, populism. The headlines, as pushed out by Oxfam fundraising, tend not to be very uplifting either. So, hunger, violence. Um, but look, compare the world now to 1945, and what you see is astonishing progress on health, on education, on rights, on violence, actually. A uh, number of battlefield deaths massively down. So I just think it's very important to finish this talk by saying there is an enormous age of development, which is still, for my money, underway. The, the book is saying that there is a little part of that which is intentional change by activists, broadly defined, and that if they think more about power and systems, they can contribute more than they're currently contributing. And I think I'll finish there. Thanks very much. Great, thanks, Duncan. Please join me up at the front. Um, we've got uh, about 30 minutes. So thank you for leaving us lots of time for discussion. Uh, we've got 30 minutes to take questions from the floor and uh, discuss what Duncan shared with us this evening. There are some roving mics that will pass around the room for questions. But I just I wanted to kick off, I mean, after talking about light bulb moments, you can't get away from telling us your light bulb moment. And so I know we've, we've uh, worked together um, and I know that you've, um, you're a physicist by training, you're sceptical of authority I would say mm -hmm. generally, uh, and, uh, and accepted wisdom, you, you like to challenge that, but you've become um, a real fan of things like uh, effective states and the role of organized religion in change. So I think I'm very interested to hear how you, what your light bulb moment okay. was and, and how is that evolution of your interest in things like states and religion and other, a broader set of change agents, how's that come to bear? 
Blimey. So you want the CV, but yeah. quick. OK. Um, well, I'll take those three. So the first light bulb moment, uh, I graduated uh, from here uh, over the road at Worcester College, Oxford, um, at a time when the only job in physics uh, was Star Wars, uh, the, the sort of defense. It wasn't a very attractive job. Um, so I instead wandered around Latin America for a couple of years, thinking, what have I done? What a terrible degree. I really should have done something else, but never mind, it's too late now. Um, I lived in Argentina under the military. And I wasn't very political before I went there, but I got pretty political very quickly, living under the military in Argentina with my friends who had disappeared relatives. My girlfriend's aunt had been disappeared. And that was sort of bubbling away. And then I met someone. So I met this uh, fantastic lapsed Jesuit called Tito Castro, um, fantastic name. Uh, and he was one of those sort of um, charismatic Latin American activists who was in a village on the shores of Lake Titicaca. So it was beautiful. And he took me in, and he just brainwashed me in about two weeks. It was very impressive. Um, his, he had decided, uh, leaving the Jesuit order, he had decided instead that he would um, run a library for indigenous leaders. And so it was basically it was all Marx. Ma uh, Mariategui, who's the sort of Peruvian equivalent of Marx, um, and he would just do reading classes with indigenous leaders. So I got to stay in his house, talk to all these indigenous leaders, and I came out. I, you know, I, everything was different. So that, that was that one. I'll, uh, and I assumed he was dead because most of the activists in that part of Peru were killed by Shining Path. And then I uh, mentioned the story to someone, a Peruvian friend, decades later. And they went, no, oh, no, he's fine. He's teaching at the UCA. So I went and had lunch with him. And he's now not quite as charismatic. He's put on rather a lot of weight. Um, and he's a sociology professor. But he's still very funny and very happy. So yeah, that's good. So he survived. Um, but I worked on Latin America. And that was my experience. I lived there for two years. I then worked as a journalist and uh, as an activist on Latin America. And that meant I was very focused on social movements, civil society, guerrilla organizations, rebellion, resistance, and the state was this dark, bad thing. <clears throat> and then I started reading about East Asia. And I met a, uh, someone who became a good friend called Ha Jun Chang, a Korean economist. Um, and I just suddenly thought, wow, you know, East Asia did a whole lot better than Latin America did. Um, and I started reading about the role of the state and industrial policy and you know, the role of the state in the East Asian transformation. So that got me thinking very much about effective states. And then religion, um, if you work on Latin America, you have to be impressed by religious activists. And I then worked, uh, ended up working at CAFOD. I was a sort of token atheist at the Catholic agency uh, in the UK. Um, and it was just amazing. You know, you would be having meetings, and they'd say, oh, I'm sorry, Sister Pat's being arrested again. You know, um, she's tied herself, she's chained herself to the railings of the Ministry of Defense. And, you know, scary nuns, people sticking with social change for decades, totally impressive. So although I'm still a devout atheist, uh, I'm completely convinced of the importance of faith in terms of motivating people's activism. Great. Thank you very much. I've, I'd, I'd like to explore the topic of activism in government, given where we are and many of the people in the audience. But uh, let's come back to that. I want to open it up to the floor. So let's take a batch of uh, three questions to start with. with that All right with you, Duncan? Yeah, sure. OK, there's a gentleman at the back there and a lady here. And then uh, anyone? There's a, uh, another lady uh, at the back there. So three questions. Would you like to start, sir? Thank you very much. My name is uh, Jelko Ivanovic. I'm one of the students at, at the school but also working with Open Side Foundation. So what you present here is really music to, to, to my ears. Um, but you, I think, just put a big question mark on our whole policy evaluation course. Because policy evaluation that we <laughs> learn here is, is firmly grounded in the theory of change concept or log frame thinking, which you just, I think, blasted gently. Uh, and, and, I, and I think you, you're right uh, that the world is increasingly complex, that log frames don't necessarily, um, not necessarily um, uh, help. At the same time, uh, it reminds me of, of what uh, great military general Klausowicz said, uh, that planning is utterly unavoidable and utterly useless. <laughs> um, uh, so coming from, from that point of view and also reading some similar work about uh, how change happens from the point of view of uh, adaptive leadership, where ambiguity is celebrated, uh, uh, contrary to, to clarity. Uh, and uh, coming also from the foundation where uh, 
the philosophy of George Soros is exactly about fallibility and reflexivity. I wanted to hear from you whether you have an example of a government that is able to uh, embrace ambiguity or tolerate ambiguity and also act in a reflexive way except for a pilot initiative, that it's actually a government that is reflective in yeah. real policy Great. terms. Thank you very much. Um, the lady in the white jumper down uh, on the, oh, oh, sorry, is in the grey jumper, sorry. Uh, what was the next question? Hi, um, my name is Hijo Kang, and I'm an under, uh, undergrad student here, uh, visiting from Columbia University. Um, but you mentioned Ha Jun Cheng, and I was wondering, because I'm Korean, so I have a vested interest in Korean matters, if you, had, uh, if you co could comment more on the role of the state in economic advancement, especially in light of the you know, recent political turmoil in Korea with the impeachment of the president, et cetera, if you had some uh, comments. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And last from this batch, uh, the lady at the back. And then I'll come to the side of the room for the next batch. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, I feel like in the time that I've been following politics, it's been mainly a story of change not happening and people trying to change. And I was wondering what do you think is the most common reason that change doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much, wow. Duncan. Three great, take those three? Yeah, um, three great questions. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to steal the Klaus Fitz quote. Thank you for that. Um, so an example of the government embracing ambiguity. I'm going to bring you an unusual one, actually. So in December, I spent a day with USAID. Um, and USAID, uh, the, the United States Aid uh, Department, who are currently feeling slightly nervous, as you can imagine, about um, the 111 senior officials who will be replaced under the US patronage system by the new president, for example, in one department, 4,000 overall in the US government. Um, they have decided that they buy into this idea that you can't predict what's going to happen, that they buy into the idea they call it adaptive management. And being USAID, they have now issued a decree in their procurement guidelines to all their people they fund, you will do adaptive management, which feels slightly contradictory, I have to say. But it's probably the only way to get these big management consultants to actually take it seriously. So they were sitting down with 200 of these management consultants, and I was one of the speakers, saying, so how do we make this happen? And the management consultants were saying things like, we need a hotline. So if one of your junior staff is, is actually behaving like a, you know, uh, is not helpful, we can denounce them. Because the, if they're saying you've got to stick to your indicators, even though the situation's changed, we need to have someone to come back on. So it was getting quite serious. So the fact that it's all their guidelines, uh, you know, for all their funding, and that they're having this sort of conversation, I thought I was pretty impressed by that. Um, I really hope that it isn't all just wiped out over the next few months. Because uh, uh, they seem to be ahead of DFID and ahead of some of the other aid agencies on that. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Korean impeachment process because I don't know anything about it, and you do. So um, I think <coughs> what I will say, as I sound like a politician, but what I will say is um, Korea is fascinating. Uh, if you come from a Latin America background, you just think, how do we do that? How? And there's this concept called embedded autonomy that Peter Evans came up with, talking about the developmental state in East Asia, that you need a state which is both embedded in the economy and the private sector, where officials understand how the private sector works, what it needs, but you also need officials to be autonomous so that they're not captured by lobbyists and by private sector interests. And that balance seems so incredibly hard to achieve. And Latin America is fine on the embedded bit, not so good on the autonomous bit. And that leads to capture and all sorts of other things. So I, it is still, I mean, Harjun sees the world through Korean eyes, not surprisingly, and basically just says to the rest of the world, well, why can't you just be like Korea? Um, it's very, very difficult. And I think it's, it's a really interesting uh, question on that one. Um, yeah, the two sequels to How Change Happens really ought to be How Shit Happens and How Change Doesn't Happen, neither of which will sell very well, I feel. But, um, um, but they're both they, they're big questions which are begged by the, the argument of the book. I'm surrounded by change not happening um, in all sorts of different arrangements, including within Oxfam. Um, and normally I find it helpful to think, is this about ideas, interests, or institutions? At least do the three eyes when you're faced with a, uh, inertia. Because if you're a lefty, you always think it's interest. You think somebody's getting rich from this. But actually, sometimes it's just that people's ideas are so fixed, they can't actually comprehend this other way of seeing the world. 
I mean that. So you know, in DFID, we 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 had. I worked for a year in DFID in mid two thousands. People would come down from the Treasury and read us the right act because we were going a bit wobbly on trade liberalisation, and they would say there are eternal truths. I, I quote from a senior Treasury official. These are the eternal truths. Trade liberalisation leads to more trade. More trade leads to less poverty. We can discuss the rest, right? That's just not true. I mean, you, could, you know, but, but that was the eternal truth as this guy was never going to change his mind. He learned that 20 years before in university and he was just going to repeat it until the day he retired. Um, so there's ideas. And then the other one is institutions. You know, the, the institutional processes, the reward systems, the incentives are massive obstacles to change, you know. I'm watching, I, at the LSE, I watch with fascination how the fact that students now have to pay a shed load of cash and are frequently asked for their opinion has remarkably little impact on the behavior of faculty, right? Because there are other forces in terms of the institution, their incentive systems, their need to publish, that actually make them not listen to the students very much. Um, I've just forgotten, I just remember this is online. Um, <laughs> Although the LSE is a great institution, right? <laughs> and they're teaching is top quality and blah, blah, blah. Um, but there's a really interesting question there about institutions and institu how institutional processes frustrate attempts at change. The, the activism is, has a lot of people who do what I call if I ruled the world. Okay? If I ruled the world, I could sort out the environmental problem like this. I would sort out tax evasion like this. And we've got to stop doing that and start thinking about political economy, incentive systems, institutions, how does all that get filtered through reality? Great, thank you. Three more questions. One at the back. Anyone else? Okay, uh, let's take uh, you, sir, and uh, uh, let's go for uh, that. I think the lady um, just in the grey jumper at the back had her hand up first, so you first. Sir. Um, yes, uh, my name is Santiago, I come from Venezuela, so all the things about Latin America, I really feel them close. And my question is, in the context of either populism fueled by natural resources or repression, authoritarian states, how do you change uh, social norms without what uh, Asimoglu, Robinson and Johnson call like an external factor or something happening by chance? So h how do you fuel change under those contexts? Hmm. Hi, Duncan. Thanks for your chat. Uh, Gary Morris, I'm a DPhil student. Um, you went as far in your um, presentation to talk about um, how do you know if change is happening. I wonder if you could go a little bit further and talk about how you make change stick. How you make change stick? Stick. stick. Mm. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, last one from this back. Hi. Uh, my name is Silvana Amaja, and I am an alumna here from the Vlavatnik School of Government. Um, given your previous knowledge on Latin America, and maybe it's a little bit uh, similar to the f uh, question previous, um, how would you suggest to the Latin American leaders that we can provoke change to face Trump and to face all the things that is happening and maybe stop depending so much on the United States? Great. Are you Thank from you. Mexico by any chance? No. Colombia. Colombia, okay, fine. Okay. So, um, Duncan, there were quite a few, there were a few other hands. Um, Do you want to take got... a few more? No, no. Well, I, you just told me to be quick. Uh, yeah, right? be, be quick. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. So polite, isn't he? Um, okay, natural resource populism. I'm, I can't imagine which country you're talking about, Santiago. Um, uh, a couple of things. One is natural resource populism is incredibly chaotic because of the dependence on oil prices. So you're constantly getting critical junctures and shocks. So it's about being responding and changing through the shock-driven change is big. Um, it's interesting to compare Venezuela and Bolivia, okay? Because Venezuela and Bolivia, you've got two natural resource-driven populist yeah. governments, and I would argue that one has been much more inclusive and effective than the other. And I, whether that's because of the nature of the Venezuelan military, the nature of the Bolivian left, it's you know, going back into the Bolivian Revolution of '52. There's lots of reasons, but at least you know natural resources are not are not always a curse. The fastest growing economy in the world over the last 50 years has been Botswana, which has diamonds and desert, uh, and has managed both very well. You know, so that's you know there there is there, there is still hope. Okay. Um, how do you make change stick? Great question. Completely flawed me. Um, I guess, yes, because if you think about things like the Egyptian Revolution. Or the Paris Accord. Or the, well, I'm more optimistic on the Paris Accord. But the Egyptian Revolution, you know, big upsurge, big upheaval, and then gets pegged back and reversed, and everything's horrible. Um, so then it's about 
how quickly can you turn movements into institutions, I think. And, that, and I think that, the, I don't know much about Egypt, but my very superficial reading is that there was a failure of imagination about turning, in, creating the institutions that would defend the revolution in Egypt and a rather short-sighted, well, the military's better than the other lot kind of sort of thing. So it's about political maturity and seizing moments, but accepting power rather than always being in opposition. So in Latin America, the Latin American left is better now, but it did have a problem with being in power. You know, that idea that as soon as someone's in a position of power, they'll betray you, all this kind of stuff is self-defeating. So it's, it's actually using power to create institutions which will become the bulwark against um, backsliding. Um, what would my advice be to Latin American leaders in the face of Trump? Um, move. Uh, but assuming that's not possible, um, wait. Okay, because I honestly, looking at the first week, a poll. How many people here think that Trump is going to finish a full term in office? How many people think he will finish a full term? How many people think he won't finish a full term in office? Well, no, 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 wishful thinking inside. You're, you're with your cold-blooded Blavatnik heads. Um, okay, that was about 50-50. That's kind of where I am at the moment. And I think there's every chance that the, this is going to get bogged down. Either he won't have the stomach for it or the U.S. system won't have the stomach for it. There's a danger. Yeah, I was talking to um, a rich person the other day. I don't often talk to rich people, but I was talking to a rich person who was saying lots of his billionaire friends are already mobilizing money to impeach. Right? And I think, that, what does that do for U.S. institutions? But... You know, there's going to be an enormous backlash at all levels, judiciary, media, uh, money. I'd say there's a fairly good chance he won't finish, in which case, think about Pence, think about what comes next. Great, thank you. I, that, I saw two hands. There's a lady over there and a gentleman here, over here in the check shirt, and just one more over there, that gentleman over there. So those are the next three. Um, four, we'll take this one, and then uh, we'll begin to, to wrap up after that. Do, do you think a, a system based on um, more Bookchin's ideas of direct de democracy, mm -hmm. where decisions are made, a bottom-up system, where decisions are made by people at the bottom, and, and how such, which at the moment is being used or applied in northern Syria, do you think change is uh, easier to happen in such systems and... Would it succeed ultimately? Great. Thank you very much. Gentleman in the check shirt. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is more from a scientific background, considering that you're yeah, uh, from a physics background. Uh, I understand, like, you know, Thomas Kuhn wrote a book around the structure of scientific revolutions, mm -hmm. where he talked a lot about paradigm shifts and also uh, how change actually happens in science. So I was wondering to what extent is there an overlap between that uh, and the theory of change that you are proposing? And what are, what are the key differences or you're building on that? Great, thank you. And gentlemen over there. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your idea of uh, dancing, dancing with the system. Uh, but I have a few concerns. Firstly, we are often constrained by our own organization or our home institution. Secondly, we might not be familiar or we might not really know the rules of the local community that we want to operate in. And thirdly, the very reason why we go into a community is precisely because we want to change some of the rules in that community. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure that from your experience, how do you balance that and how dancing with the system actually look like in practice with all these concerns. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, this lady over here for the last question from this batch. Hello. Um, before coming to here, I and one of my classmates, we were talking that how frustrating it is to be part of a system and not be in the top level, in the middle level, or to be a junior staff, or, or not actually the top of staff, where you, can, you actually have the power to change. So in Sometimes I feel that when we are in this position, we become part of the system. The government that we criticize, we actually start supporting it once we enter. Um, especially because we, it, it, it's a process that maybe sometimes happens unconsciously and also because we feel that so hopeless or helpless to, to bring change mm -hmm. because we are not in the top level. So what do you think? When can we bring change? And for what shall we make the, our target? Shall we? Uh, make our target to go in the top level and bring change, or just to start from wherever we are? Okay, great. 
These are amazing questions. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm in a viver at the moment. <laughs> yes, I, and, 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 and there are still more hands to come. At some point, we'll have to close it off. But, um, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll stay for as long as you want to. But, um, <laughs> okay. Direct democracy. Um, Post-Brexit, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a big fan, I have to say. You know, government by referendum hasn't had a good year. Um, I think I, I'm torn on this one. Right? And the good thing about having a book which says how good it is to be ambiguous and uncertain and humble is I don't have to have answers, and that's fine. I mean, on the one hand, I, you, know, you want to see people engaged in decisions which affect their lives. On the other hand, that le leads to populism and demagoguery and all sorts of other situations where it actually can go horribly wrong. So, you know... Rwanda, the genocide, was an exercise in active citizenship. It was just a very nasty one. And that's the kind of, that's what worries me. So I'm, I'm actually probably, and this comes back to your point as I get older and more reformist, I think you need some breaks on that directness uh, because it can go so badly wrong. On the other hand, it's very disruptive in a positive way. So direct democracy is actually, you know, in a way, a popular expression of, of, of desire for change can be very, it can loosen the system, but I don't think it's ever been a stable system, I mean, uh, for a long period of time. Um, Kuhn, interesting. So paradigm shifts happen when the existing paradigm gets, the evidence piles up against it, and you have to create more and more little sort of tweaks to keep the evidence matching your theory until eventually someone like Einstein comes along and says, I've got a new theory, and everything makes sense again until the next time. And in a way, that's neater than what happens in politics, but, but, but comparable. I think what happens in, in, in politics and social change is that the idea of what is possible evolves over time. A thing called the Overton window, where, you know, 10, 10 years ago, you couldn't talk about this crazy thing called the Tobin tax, uh, or, you know, small tax on currency transactions. 10 years, yeah, but because of the financial crisis and the change in the attitudes towards the financial sector, it's now become, it's becoming policy in 10 European countries. So think that the Overton window moves and what, it, what can be discussed in public debate changes. So it's, a, it's comparable to the paradigm shifts, but it's a bit messier and less satisfying. There are, the, the, sorry, who was it asked me about the paradigm shifts? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's lots of questions about whether actually science works in that sensible way, because actually people are quite capable of believing things which you know, aren't true in science, just like anywhere else. But... Um, uh, great question. On, is dancing with the system accepting the system? I'm going to reinterpret your question. Is dancing with the system accepting the system, including when the system is really nasty? And, and no. But dancing with the system is understanding the system before you start passing judgment. So um, actually being really curious about why people voted for Brexit or Trump. How many people, I'm not one of them, is actually going out? I was talking to a, a, a friend who went into a pub in Blackbird Lees after Brexit and just started asking people why they voted for Brexit. Just was curious about where they were coming from. And I don't think we do that nearly enough. And there was a really interesting discussion on my blog about, from a lot of people commenting about how do you get out of the filter bubble? Turn off the computer. Join a club which is not about politics. Join a sports club, join a, join a choir, join something where people are not there because of their political alignment, and then you'll get views, a range of views, and then you can start to actually understand the system. You still need red lines, you still need moral values, and you still need to decide how to engage with this system. But also, if you're actually trying to intervene in a local situation as a foreigner, you probably should have another think. It's got to be about who you're working with from the local communities who understand the system and are less liable to get it horribly wrong than are somebody coming in from outside. So, you know, I think there's real dangers about just barreling in and saying, we can fix this. Uh, but that generally doesn't, work, doesn't end well. Um, traumatic question. So where do you put yourself from being a helpless youth to being a complacent person in power? And at what point do you actually manage to bring about change? I was like, oh, my God, I felt really depressed when you were asking that question. Um, I think <clears throat> youth aren't as helpless as they think. Um, and, you know, there is a case for activism. I think, in, personally, in, in, in terms of Oxfam, I think our big untapped form of activism is actually old people. So people now are retiring at 60, 65, 20 years of activism ahead of them, if they're interested, lots of contacts, Lots of experience, lots of wisdom, and so I wish we could have more 
Grey Panther campaigners. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting anywhere with convincing Oxfam on that one. But at each point, you can do things in terms of what you buy, in terms of the decisions you make, how you vote, you know, what you decide to do with your spare time. It just gets really difficult in the middle. So you know, when you're young, you can do it. Kids' job, ah, and it's really difficult, and then it gets easier later on. So it's kind of the, there's a life cycle of activism, which is really quite interesting, and I'd quite like to write something about that at some point. Sounds like that's an invitation for someone to uh, contribute a blog. To, from Papadi Rao about activism in government and, and you know when and, and in a big big hierarchy how I'm do you always open change? to offers um, I, I, I think we, we need to draw to, to a close I had one quick question and there were two uh, ha people that indicated uh, they wanted to ask a question do you still want to sir do you want to okay so I'll just ask my question and there's a gentleman at the yep. back who wants to ask a question and then we'll and then we'll bring it into land um, so my question is about doing all of this in, po in a world of post-truth you know, post-truth politics. Yeah. Um, so in a, in a traditional NGO campaign, you'll, the first thing you'll do is do a research report and decide what your killer facts are and, uh, and what, you know, what the evidence is for the change. Um, yeah. And that seems more and more challenging in, in, the, in the current uh, you know, world, you know, the world we're entering now. Yeah. So your, your views on, on what po the post-truth Yep. Um, season that we're in means for, for all of this. And so, your question at the back. The mic, please. Uh, my name is Marcos Freitas. I'm a visiting fellow here at the Blavatnik School. And I come from Brazil. And I wanted to introduce the word corruption mm -hmm. when it comes to change. Because, you know, Brazil is going through a major uh, scandal that is basically, we found out that most of the Congress people are involved somehow. Now, the population wants change, but the system is corrupt. How do you change it, and how can you alter it with the same players? Particularly considering also that the international community wants to see stability. <laughs> how do you do that? So, Duncan, maybe as you think about your answer to that, I'll, I'll just read a quote from your book. Uh, it was towards the end of the, the, the section on nations or governments. States are complex systems. The solidity of presidential palaces and halls of the people are, in fact, ephemeral, built upon the shifting sands of legitimacy and events. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> <laughs> Nudge. Um, so I don't think we're post-truth, actually. I think we're post-data, post-numbers. Um, I just think we've had a very narrow view of what constitutes truth for people. Uh, I think, um, I mean, the argument I'm making on the blog and elsewhere is that we need to get much, much better narratives at stories which mean something to people. We've got sucked into this evidence based uh, sort of geeky world where, you know, you do your RCT or you do your regression and, ha, I've proved it. Next, next question. And that's not how people make the decisions, and that's not how people feel or see the world. And I, I honestly think that misses out a lot of things which are, which are actually very real. So I had a really interesting discussion with somebody within Oxfam who was talking about our, our paper for the Davos meeting earlier, uh, earlier this month, saying, yeah, we've got this great new idea, human economy. And I, I just thought, God, that's really boring. You know? I mean, the, uh, economy with an adjective. OK, yeah, yeah sustainable, care, economy. You know, neoliberal economy, human economy. Okay, okay, okay. And, uh, and I've just been listening to Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, quoting from Martin Luther King, it's a time to build bridges, not walls. Right? And that seemed to speak so much more directly to uh, the current stage, you know, where it can mean lots of different things. It doesn't matter. It's, it's got an emotional content which a clever, geeky idea doesn't have. And we've got to get much better at building those things. Um, Alex Evans has got a book out called The Myth Gap, which is saying we've just got really bad at building progressive myths, and that's what we need to do to re recover some of that lost ground. While we've been doing our regressions, other people have been constructing rather regressive myths and doing very well with them. So I think winning back the, the, the narrative fight, I think, is important. Um, Brazil, can you change things with the same players without causing instability? Um, very difficult, isn't it? I mean... Uh, and in Brazil, it appears like everybody, there is there's no little clean bit, in the, certainly in Congress. Um, 
some of the things people write about this, you know, obviously I'm sure you, you probably know much more about it than I do, but the, yeah, there are often pockets of effectiveness, islands of effectiveness, sometimes in the, ta in the tax office or wherever. It's about identifying and supporting those and trying to help them sort of spread out. The pockets of effectiveness might be at sub-national level. So you're building a cleaner state based on the bits that do work. Um, in some cases, you need, a, you need upheaval. I think. So, you know, the, the last big upheaval in, in Brazilian politics was the PT. Maybe we need a new one. Yeah, maybe there's going to be something else coming up now. Um, I'm not sure you can do that with total stability. <laughs> great. Well, um, thank you, everyone, for actively participating. It's yeah, a wonderful question. Great questions. Thank you very much. Thank you f to Duncan for coming to BSG and for giving an excellent talk and your insightful answers. Thank you very much. And I, uh, I think there are books on sale outside, and I think Duncan's willing to sign, uh, etc. Absolutely.